So Newcastle Road is located up Harbor Street. And can you And ma'am, if you could go ahead and initial and put the date on that uh, in the margin for us. Again, I took photographs of the area and the cell phone case that was on the ground before collecting it. Commissioner Approach, Your Honor? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked in states number 57 and 58. Yes, I do. And how do you recognize those items? These are photographs that I took out on the stadium near Carver um, of the surrounding area and then of the cell phone cover laying in the grass next to the road. And what type of equipment were you using that day to take those photographs? My department issued Nikon D90 camera. And ma'am, do those photographs accurately depict a photo or the uh, scene as you saw them through the lens? Yes, they do. And are they changed in any way from what you saw through that lens of your camera and capture? No, ma'am. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to introduce State's Exhibit number 57 and 58 into uh, evidence for substantive purposes. No objection. Thank you. State's Exhibit 57 and State's Exhibit 58 are admitted for substantive purposes. Thank you. Permission to have them published, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Permission to approach? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. If you could um, put State's Exhibit number 57 up on the projector. And if you could tell us what we're looking at here. Uh, so this is the area of Stadium Drive. And what, what it's showing here is standing where the um, cell phone cover is and the surrounding area. And ma'am, there's a, um, a, a landmark. Um, just uh, visible in that. Could you tell us what that landmark is? Um, there's, a, there's a tower located here. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And if you could please um, put number 58 up on and show us what we're looking at here. So this is the um, grassy area uh, of stadium between the roadway and the sidewalk uh, just just past the curb area and here located in the picture is the cell phone cover. And ma'am, um, which side of the road was that cell phone cover located on? Well, if you were going north on Stadium, then it was going to be on the left side of the road. Thank you. Ma'am, did you um, respond to aid in a um, search warrant of uh, Rosetta? Yes, I did. And ma'am, did you uh, aid in a walkthrough of that house? Yes, ma'am. And uh, did you take photos? Yes, I did. Permission to approach? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit number 54 and 53. Ma'am, were you the only person who was taking photos? Yes, I was. Mr. 
Now I want to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 53 and 54. Ma'am, do you recognize those photos? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize those photos? These are photographs that I took of the interior of the apartment that was being searched. And, um, ma'am, do those accurately depict the scene as you saw it? Yes, they do. Your Honor, at this time I'd like to go ahead and introduce State's Exhibit Number 53 and 54 into correction, 54 and 55 into uh, evidence for illustrative purposes. What are the numbers on that? Um, 53 and 54. Let's change the numbers. I already have 53. I think it should be 54 and 55. Permission to approach, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Was there any objection? Oh, um, no, Your Honor. And that was for illustrative purposes? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And ma'am, if you can show us um, what you saw in the house when you uh, searched it. Permission to have them published? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Your Honor. Permission to approach? Yes, ma'am. You put item number 55 up on the... And can you tell me what we're seeing here? Well, this is interior of the apartment in one of the bedrooms and the items that were located within. And number 54. And number 54 uh, as well is a photograph of the same bedroom within the apartment and the items that it contained within the bedroom. Thank you. Now, going back to when you went to the pool house to collect the items uh, from the pool house, you stated that you spoke with both Investigator McMaster and the maintenance man? Correct. What, if anything, did the maintenance man um, tell you about the uh, items that were located? Objection to the hearsay, Your Honor. Is it being offered for the truth of the matter asserted? No, Your Honor, just for what action she took afterwards, and he's already testified. All right. The uh, objection is overruled. Um, the, matter, the testimony is not the truth of the matter asserted, but as it relates to what the officer did as a result of being told this, and and for corroboration or impeachment, as the case may be, of a prior testimony of another witness. Go ahead and answer your question, please. When I arrived on scene and spoke with the maintenance man, he informed me that um, and after going into the bathroom of the pool house, that he had seen uh, an article of clothing atop the, the trash in the trash can at which time he lifted that article of clothing and noticed them, a set of handcuffs and a Durham Police Department police badge located in the trash can. And ma'am, what did you do based on that interaction with the maintenance man? Well, I took photographs of the scene. Um, I collected the items of evidence uh, from the trash can and uh, I took uh, elimination uh, swab and prints from the maintenance man. And ma'am, um, where was that pool house located? The pool house is located roughly in the center of the complex. Um, it's to the left of the swimming pool. Uh, there's a gate around the swimming pool and it's uh, surrounded by bushes and a grassy area, um, pretty much in the, in the center of the complex. And uh, did you observe anything to the rear of that pool house complex? Um, to, well, to the rear of the pool house um, is, is a street and uh, it leads into other, into apartments, buildings of, uh, within the complex.
Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness at this time. Thank you. Mr. Sipple, can you take a look? Mr. Charnes, questions of Ms. Manfred. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Ms. Manfred. Good morning, sir. So the, the garbage can in the pool house is not at Rosetta Drive, is it? It's not. The, the pool house is not anywhere near Rosetta Drive. It's at Newcastle, isn't it? I am not certain of the exact address of the pool house itself. I know that it's within the apartment complex, but as far as if it has a specific address number, I don't know. I just know it's within the apartment complex. So you don't know whether that's at Rosetta Drive, the pool? Without looking at a map, I couldn't tell you which of the, which, which street it is named of. Are you, can I approach to take a look at your notes? I don't, I don't have any notes up here, sir. Did someone tell you not to bring notes to testify in this courtroom? No, sir. And your notes are voluminous, aren't they? I'm not sure what you're... You got a lot of notes. You take notes. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. It's important to document everything you did, isn't it? I do have to document everything that I do. And you'd agree that this term crime scene, if no crime is committed, it's not a crime scene, is it? It's hard for us to know until we get there and see what's going on and process the scene if a crime has occurred or not. Well, that's what the jury is to decide if it's a crime, isn't it? That's their job, not your job. I'm not sure if it's going to be a crime scene, which is what I was asked, until I arrive and know what has happened. But you still call it a crime scene, even if you don't know, right? Not necessarily. Well, you said there was a crime scene taped. In this instance, yes. But it hadn't been determined whether a crime had been committed, correct? We had someone injured. But someone injured does not make a crime, does it? We don't know yet. But you still call it a crime scene taped. Yes. Thank you. So on the gunshot residue form, if someone were riding motorcycles or fishing, that would be noted on the form, wouldn't it? If they inform us of that, when we ask them the question of what they were doing from the time of the gunshot until now, if they inform us of that, when we ask that question, then it would be recorded. And you were at the hospital when Marilyn Coble was there with the gunshot residue kit, weren't you? No, sir. Crime scene technicians, M. Coble, M. Coble is Marilyn Coble, correct? Yes. Who's T. Jones? That's Tanisha Jones. H. Madry is you, correct? That is correct. And A. Hutchins is, tell us who A. Hutchins is. Allison Hutchins. And did you go to the hospital? No, I did not. The emergency department? No, I did not. But you don't have your records with you, correct? Not in front of me, no. But you know that from your memory, you didn't go to the hospital? Correct. And the review of my notes before I did come in. Okay, and when did you review them? I reviewed them last week and I reviewed them this morning. And why didn't you bring them with you? I usually don't bring my notes into court. And you talked about, you took an elimination swab from the maintenance man? Correct. What is that? That is to, it's a DNA swab. And so if he had touched the items in any way, or if he had sneezed over them or anything that would leave his DNA present on the items, an elimination swab is to eliminate him as having touched those items. And was there any gunshot residue swabbing of that waste basket that had the cuffs and the badge and the 
close on top. Is there any gunshot residue swabbing? No, sir. Corporal Investigator McMaster did not ask you to do gunshot residue swabbing of that waste basket, correct? Correct. And had a handgun that had been fired been placed in there, the gunshot residue swabbing might have told us the answer to that, or at least given some indication, correct? When an item is left somewhere that has gunshot residue present upon it, it is possible that gunshot residue is left. But that waste basket was not tested for gunshot residue? Not by me, not to my knowledge. And the maintenance man's hands weren't checked for gunshot residue, correct? No, sir. And that was, a, that was the 19th, so the, a day later, you're taking pictures of what's in the waste basket, is that right? That's correct. So you don't know what happened in that day, correct? No, sir. Or whether things have been moved, right? Correct. Or whether something had been placed in that waste basket in the course, over the course of that day. That is right? correct, yes, sir. And you don't know whether there had been a gun in there and it was taken out, right? Correct. And there was a massive search for uh, that weapon the day before, correct? You were advised of that, right? Yes. And you were out there looking for projectiles at Forest Drive on the 18th, the day before, correct? Yes, sir. And you were doing that because Corporal Investigator McMaster said it was the possibility of three shots, right? That I do not know. I was going on what I was informed of by Supervisor Hutchins. And Supervisor Hutchins told you that some information that it was the possibility of three shots, correct? I was never given a number. But you were, you, you were looking for more than one, weren't you? I did not know how many I was looking for. Wouldn't that be important to know how many you were looking for? I'm there to find whatever I can find irrelevant. Like if I were given a number of three, I wouldn't want to stop just because I had found three. I would keep going. And the casing could fly feet from where it was discharged, correct? It is possible, yes. So that's why you're looking in a large area, correct? Yes, that and it can be um, transplanted by um, a car tire or a foot kicking it or something of that nature. Thank you. And when you came upon the scene, it, you said it was noon? I'm sorry? Was it about noon at Forest Drive? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And did, do you know anywhere in your report what the temperature was? I recall noting on that day that the temperature was cool and roughly 60 degrees. In your report? You put that down? Correct. And were you there? Is there any note that you saw about what the temperature was at 10.20 a.m.? No, sir, I do not know. And you weren't there? No, sir, I was not. So the, uh, what happened to the DNA swab of the maintenance man? Was that sent off to the lab in Raleigh? I cannot attest to that. Um, I turn it over to the lead crime scene investigator and I do not know if the lead uh, crime scene investigator along with the investigating officer decided to send that to the SBI lab or not. that sent me out there to Forest Drive that there was a chase through the woods? Um, I, I was told on Forest Drive, no, I don't, I don't recall anything about a chase through the woods.
And were there items, by the time you got there, this is not quite two hours after whatever happened, happened there, correct, at Forest Drive? Yes. And what was still out in the parking lot? What, what items that might be evidence were out there? Anything still left? Not to my knowledge. I, I was there strictly to search with the metal detector. Okay. And can you describe, in a little, what, can you describe over what area did you search? Um, the drive, the, the road that leads in um, where I was informed that the officer's vehicle and the suspect vehicle was located. And there was a dumpster just to the left of that area, and there was a grassy area to the right of it. Um, so the whole uh, paved area, as well as the grassy area to the right, and the area uh, of a dumpster around to the left, and a little uh, wood line um, in front of the dumpster area. I may have a moment, Your Honor. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Medley. That would be our questions at this time. Further questions for the witness from the state? No redirect this time, Your Honor. Permission to approach? Yes. Can I get the uh, exhibits? Yes. Ms. Madden, please sit down. Thank you, sir. McMaster. Please spell that for the court before. T H O M A S. And the last name is McMaster. M C M A S T E R. How are you employed, sir? I'm a police officer with the city of Durham. How long have you held that job? Approximately ten and a half years. I was sworn to uh, January 2005. What position do you currently hold? I'm currently the corporal in the special operations division which in my specific responsibility is within the major crimes unit. Um, major crimes unit is- You're not asking to answer the question on the frolic, I object. Overrule, continue with your answer. Major crimes unit is one of the several units within the special operations division. Um, I was reassigned there approximately January of this year. Uh, major crimes unit, much like the unit that investigator Stewart works on, deals with some quality of life issues, drug issues. We are a covert or plain clothes unit, if you will. Um, I don't wear a uniform to work every day. I, typically, my uniform is jeans and a t-shirt uh, currently. I'm the first level of supervision on that unit. So there's a sergeant, self the corporal, and then seven to eight investigators on that unit. Is that the position that you held on December 18th of 2004? It is not. What position did you hold on that day? On that day, I was assigned to the Criminal Investigation Division, which is the detectives or the investigators within the department. I believe it was described earlier. I was a corporal at that time of the homicide unit. So that unit has a sergeant, myself, the first level of supervision, and then seven or eight homicide investigators. And what are the duties of the homicide unit? 
The homicide unit um, does a lot more than the name would suggest. Obviously, we would investigate any time there's a death or a, 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 that's caused by someone homicide. Um, any unattended death, so and not, not to say that a death that someone isn't there to observe it, but unattended in North Carolina is defined as not under the doctor's care or unexpected. So if I were to drop dead today in my living room, I'm in relatively good health, it would be unexpected, that's unattended. So the homicide unit investigates that, works with the medical examiner's office to find resolution to those cases. Homicide unit handles suicide cases. The homicide unit also handles uh, serious or, or believed to be in danger, seriously in danger of missing person cases. And then the final thing that we handle and investigate are officer-involved injuries and officer-involved shootings and incidents where there is um, officer involvement and force used. Um, those investigations typically are the responsibility of one of the supervisors, either the sergeant or myself, um, in the homicide unit handle the officer involved shootings um, from a criminal standpoint. Were you working and on duty on December 18th of 2000? Yes, ma'am, I was. My official day when I worked in the homicide unit was 8 to 4.30. Um, it was rare that I wasn't at my desk by 7, and it was also equally unusual that I wasn't there after 4.30. Um, and then the uh, 25 or 35 times a year that someone was killed, it might be 3 o'clock in the morning, we got out of bed, put on some clothes, and would go out to the scene. So I didn't have really regular work hours. I had a regular schedule, but it was rarely kept. On that day, um, I was at headquarters at uh, 505 West Chapel Hill Street where the homicide office is. Um, we had had scheduled for some time a meeting with some special agents with the State Bureau of Investigations for that morning. Um, the meeting was to start, I can't remember if it was at 10.30 or 11. Um, the gentlemen, the agents from the SBI were at the office. Um, prior to walking and entering the meeting, we began to hear a lot of sirens and a lot of noise coming around headquarters. It was cars that obviously were responding to something quickly, police cars and sirens and ambulances. You could hear a whole set of sirens. Um, that piques our interest in the homicide unit because oftentimes when we hear that, we're about ready to go to work. We're going to go and start do the, doing the real work that we do. Um, we turned on radio and uh, began to monitor um, what was going on. I learned from he was then Lieutenant Pickerel, he's now um, uh, Captain in District 2. He uh, indicated to me that an officer had been involved in a, in, and it was injured and that it was Investigator Stewart. This was at approximately 10.30 that morning. What did you do upon learning that information? Um, grabbed my keys, got in my car and began to immediately drive to Forest Drive. Um, on the way out, the Sergeant, Sergeant Pennick at the time of the homicide unit, um, and I agreed that I would handle this case, this investigation, be the lead investigator. Um, so my thought and my plan was to get there as quickly as I could to um, be involved with the scene. And how were you dressed on that day? I would have been dressed similar to the way I am now. Um, I, I can't say specifically, but people made fun of me because 99% of the time I wore a shirt and tie even when I didn't have to. Um, out of respect for uh, the job, I wore a tie every day. Approximately what time did you arrive on the scene? It would have been about 10 minutes later, I'd say um, 1040 um, in the morning. It's, it's not a long drive from headquarters, and um, I was in a hurry, admittedly, to get there. Describe the scene when you got there. When I got to the scene, it was, um, it was busy. Uh, there was a lot of police cars and a lot of police people, a lot of police officers there, investigators and officers and cars. Um, I parked, I, I believe at Sedgefield, short of and had to walk in because there were so many cars. Um, as I approached on foot from the west, I could see a very well-defined scene. Um, there was what we call crime scene tape. Uh, it's the yellow tape that says crime scene on it. That's why we call it crime scene tape um, for no reason other than it's, it's just easy. 
Um, there was tape everywhere. There was a very large, very well-defined, very well-protected area um, that we could work in. We always ask and stress with new officers and any officer I can have a chance, please get me a scene as big as you can. Take city blocks if you can. We can make it smaller, but once we set up a scene, it's harder to make you it bigger. You object to what they generally do, as opposed to what they did here. Give me one second, please. The, um, Mr. McMaster, if, uh, is that what you, for my clarification, is that what you did on this occasion or not what you did on this occasion? On that occasion, I don't recall us ever making the scene smaller until we were done. When I got there, the scene had already been established and it was large. Next question. Thank you, Your Honor. Corporal McMaster, you mentioned that when you arrived, you parked um, near Sedgefield, would that have been inside or outside of the defined park scene? My vehicle originally was parked outside. What was the weather like on that day? There's been a lot of talk about the weather. It was cool, but I my memory is that it was abnormally warm for December. It was I would have most likely not been wearing a jacket, just in shirt sleeves, and don't recall being cold, but comfortable. What did you do when you first arrived? Um, the first thing I did was I, I walked and approached the crime scene, um, took a, a wide view of it as wide as I could, kind of from where Forrest and Sedfield come to a, a, a juncture, and then Forrest continues into the apartment complex. So I walked up and, and to take an overall wide view and see what, what it was and what the scene was that I would be having to deal with and manage that scene for probably the next several hours. And what, if anything, did you observe from that? The first thing I saw was the uh, silver Explorer, the silver SUV that I later found out was, in fact, the one that was operated by Investigator Stewart, um, parked towards the entrance but inside the apartment complex. Um, I recognized it as one uh, that the city owned and the city operated for the Special Operations Division. And how were you able to recognize that? And there was lights that were uh, illuminated. Uh, the, the blue lights or the red and blue lights were, were flickering and were still in operation. What else did you notice, if anything else? Uh, I, I noticed officers that had probably been there early on in the scene, so I went um, to talk to them. Objection and motion to strike what he assumed. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this testimony right there is not for the truth of the matter asserted, but why this officer took what action he took as he approached the uh, investigative scene. Okay. I, I went and found an officer that I knew had been there longer than I had because he was already inside the crime scene and passed me, and I had not seen him walk past me. Um, there was a sergeant who was the sergeant on the patrol unit at the time in that district, and I went and asked him if he would please tell me what he knew about the incident and essentially get an overall briefing of what had occurred or what was known at that time. What did you do next? I walked um, and looked in the area, um, the specific area where the uh, where investigator Stewart had been found um, by responding officers lying on the ground with the gunshot wound to his leg. Was Investigator Stewart still on scene when you arrived? He was not. Investigator Stewart had already been transported um, to the local hospital by EMS personnel. Had 
have your forensics unit arrive? They had not. Um, Sergeant Pennick and I would have been on the phone uh, several times by this point um, discussing what assets we needed, who we needed, and what type of help we would need for this investigation. Um, typically speaking, and, and Objection, my memory. Typically, as opposed to this case, Your Honor. Does your reference to, for my clarification, does your reference to what you typically do have some Our, our standard operating procedure would be that one of the supervisors from the homicide unit call Ms. Hutchins, who testified here last week, the supervisor of the Forensic Services Division, to let her know what we had, and she could then send the people that she wanted to send and the assets that she wanted to send to complete their side of the investigation, if you will. I can contact my people that directly report to me to assist me, and I can call her, Ms. Hutchins, to ask her to send people to help as well. And that's what we did. So what happened between the time that you arrived and the time that the Forensic Services Unit arrived at the scene? The piece of paper that Investigator Stewart had written, the license plate number down, that ended up being on the uh, Nissan, was given to me. Um, I took possession of that and held it until forensic services arrived. Um, Ms. Jones, who was here last week, took that from my possession. Um, I gave it to her as quickly as I could. I didn't want to be responsible for that. I wanted her, the proper people, to have that as quickly as possible. Um, a, a general stance was taken that we looked, we observed, but we don't touch. Um, it's very important, and in this case included, that the homicide unit not contaminate, not change, not do anything to a scene. The Forensic Services Division and their investigators and technicians and specialists process, document, and collect evidence. The investigators do not. So I would have, I did, told everyone to stay back, don't touch anything, keep your hands off. And how was that accomplished until FSU? I stood in that general area and made sure everyone stayed away. Um, it's, it's not a glamorous part of the job, but it's something that had to be done. I tell people to stay away. And about how long did it take for FSU to arrive? I would estimate probably 30 minutes. Um, Your Honor, I object to the strike because he's estimating I don't see his notes up there. Thank you. The objection is over. You may continue to testify. You estimate what? 30 minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. What happened next? As Ms. Jones stated, I, I stayed. I stayed with her. Um, I briefed her, I told her what I knew, what I believed I knew, what I had been able to uh, develop and, and investigate and learn in that short period of time. Um, they began, the Forensic Services Unit being they, to process that scene, to document it via photograph, to um, take their overalls, their close-ups, the videos, um, and physically collect evidence. And what had you learned up to that point? I had learned that, obviously, Investigator Stewart had received a very serious injury to his right leg. He had been shot. Um, Your Honor, I object that he's been shot. Move to strike. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, would you step to your remember the admonition by previous evidence?
what's objectionable? Your reason for objecting to he had been shot? Because it implies he's been sitting here the whole time. He's the chief investigator. It implies that my client shot him, which is the intent. How do you get that, how do you get that leap from he has been shot to your client shot him? Versus that's, he shot himself. That's how I understand what he's saying, and he's the lead investigator and making a motion to dismiss, motion for a mistrial based on that statement. I have no further argument. That's how well, I understand. I want to hear your argument, though. My argument, he's been shot. He didn't say he shot himself with his hand on the gun. He didn't say it was a struggle. He said he's been shot. And this he's been shot implies that he's been shot by this man who is accused of it. He's been sitting here this whole time uh, hearing everything, that everything's been said. Uh, they didn't bring the SBI in this case. He knows exactly what he's doing, and that's the way I heard it, Your Honor. I heard it as he's um, saying it in such a way that he's been shot by this man. That's how I heard it. He didn't say he's been shot by this man. He said Officer Stewart's been shot. He didn't say Officer Stewart shot himself with his own gun, which of course he's not going to say based on his uh, allegiances. But he's been shot instead of he received. Uh, we've had other, other witnesses with this issue. He received a gunshot wound. That would be accurate. That would be neutral. He is biased. He has his allegiance to this man. He's got his back. And that's how I perceive it. So that's all I can say as a, as a criminal defense lawyer saying he's been shot implies that he shot him. I object. Thank you. Your motion for mistrial is denied. The objection is overruled. Um, it's for the jury to sort out some way here. I, I didn't, um, uh, I understand what you're saying about th that he received a gunshot wound. Would it, uh, would have been completely neutral. But we'll wait, we'll wait. Thank you.
let the record reflect we were I was speaking and Mr. Riley needed to step out for a moment uh, for a comfort break and uh, so we paused out. Now finishing up copies of those workers comp records, we'll have those distributed to you here in the next few moments. Uh, or when there's a break that won't interfere with the you know, testimony or anything like that or question. Um, anyway, the uh, the objection is um, overruled. You got the record the motion to be filed is denied or anything else you might want to say before the jury comes back. Real, no, brief, real briefly, I uh, have not received a response to my email that I put on the record earlier. I've asked uh, Mr. Donovan to call and tell the chief on my subpoena was for 10 a.m. and I haven't heard back from Mr. Donovan who may be in another courtroom, but in any event, they did not. Tony Smith, the police attorney, has not responded to my email uh, just to inform the court of that. And you will, uh, it's about 11.25 now, we'll be going a few more minutes before we take our mid-morning recess. Um, but we're, at this point, we're going to bring the jury back in. Chair, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Question? No, the next question is where is the next juror there? Yeah. We are, we, at the record reflect we have one juror that's not back. Thank you very much. Two jurors that are not back. CSI and the Forensic Services Unit that Investigator Stewart had received this injury while attempting to complete a traffic stop at that area on Forest Road. Um, I learned that during that traffic stop, 
that was never completed. Objection and motion to strike. Ladies and gentlemen, jury, sit back and do it. In fact, we're going to take our morning recess right here. Please remember these admonitions. Do not communicate with each other anyone else about the case. Do not allow anyone to talk about the case in the present. Do not talk to or have any contact with any parties, attorneys, or witnesses. Do not con uh, conduct any investigation. Receive or attempt to receive any reports or information related to the case from any source. And, of course, do not form or express an opinion about the case. Well, everyone else remains seated and of course they can where they are. Uh, 15 minute recess is so 15 minutes. stop to then alert and be alert to the fact that there was a vehicle that was missing and that we were looking for at that time. So to then interact with other investigators, other officers in the hopes and the search for that vehicle. All right. Now, let me uh, hear from you, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. Uh, what we, I, I hate to use this phrase, but it's from my perspective, this gentleman is a prejudiced machine. He's been wound up he looks directly at the jury, he says things um, that are designed to prejudice them. I, whether this traffic stop is completed or not has nothing to do with anything. He wants to let them know it's his position and his opinion based on his working with the prosecutor sitting there that he wants them to know that's their theory. So he's presenting their theory, it's prejudicial, there's a car that left the scene. That's not prejudicial. His whole way of presenting this is to prejudice the jury, to say things, to pop it out. And I would ask Your Honor that I'm glad we're having this conversation now because he's the lead investigator. They didn't call in the SBI, which they've done in the work the case, the Compo case, other cases. They had an SBI. Uh, agent in during the interrogation of my client. But then 
they did it themselves. So now they're left with this bias, this, this conflict of interest, representing, investigating their own. It's like someone asked me to investigate John Donovan instead of the state bar. So he, every chance, from my perspective, as my client's lawyer, he, he, just the way he's presenting this, Your Honor, including, he doesn't know whether the traffic stop was completed. It wasn't called in. And so I would ask that this be stopped now because he's a misdraw machine from my perspective. And that's, again, I would ask for a mistrial because he's talking about an uncompleted traffic stop for the truth of the matter asserted, and that's why he's popping off. So he's asked a question, he goes off on a frolic. And I object, and I think it's going to continue. Thank you. Most of the mistrial was uh, denied. The, um, for my clarification, and of course the jury's not here in the courtroom, but um, was this prior to receiving the information, the, the paper that had the license tag, or was it subsequent that this 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 uh, statement you made about learning uh, that it was a an uncompleted traffic stop. Do you recall? My recollection is that it would have been at the same time. The information I received was from the patrol sergeant, and I received that piece of paper with the tag number written on it from him during the same interaction. All right. What what I'm get, trying to get across here is that this and this will this will play. Th this is goose and gander again. This will play for the defense just as well as it plays for the uh, state here. That having a witness on the stand does not entitle that witness to to even if the witness is kind of the overarching person that gathered evidence together to repeat to to go through the entire story, uh, only the parts that the officer was involved in, and, uh, and there may be evidence that officer received some information, and it, the explanation being I got that at the same time I got this license tag, uh, and then the officer directs that, that uh, wouldn't be hearsay because it would not be offered for the truth of the matter asserted, only because um, to explain why the officer said, all right, we need to send out a bolo or whatever they call the thing, and uh, um, or be. Um, but I, I just want to emphasize that uh, we'll, we'll be doing this all day long, and with any witness that is called upon to just give a narrative, because you know, you can learn things from people talking to you on the radio, uh, maybe stuff in the news. There are all kinds of ways people learn stuff. The mere fact that you develop a, a, a narrative to tell may come from sources that are inappropriate. On the other hand, everything that another individual says to the officer, which is information that the officer then takes action based on, versus just, they told me this. And nothing beyond that. If, they, if it's just told to me, then that's hearsay. If you told me something, and based on that, I do something, then it's not hearsay. Or as an exception to hearsay, it's not offered for the truth of the matter, sir, only to, uh, that because of this information, the officer Took a step, you know, took action, made a, a directive, or whatever the case may be. So, as we're going forward, if we keep that distinction in mind, um, that will help us keep from bringing the jury in and out, in and out, in and out. And uh, it will give some um, sort of continuity to the, to the process. The, uh, 
a, a, poli a police report, for example, brings in information from lots of places because one police officer can't do the entire investigation on, on many things. But that doesn't make that police report admissible per se unless it needs an entry rule, such as information was given to you and you acted upon it in some defined way, some that, that's connected to what was told to you. And of course, sometimes, even if that's in this light, if there's an objection, I have to do a four three balance, and you know, there, there are other, other thoughts and other considerations. But, um, I, let me just, you know, I come from a background of domestic cases, and of course, one party wanted to get on the stand and tell the story. Whether they knew it or someone had told it to them or they heard about it on Facebook, what they wanted to put it all together and really give you their opinion. And I'm not saying you're doing that all sort of nice, but and I used to have to sort that stuff all the time. So I'm a I'm a little attuned to trying to make sure that um, that uh, it it is not just an error. It is not just telling the story, uh, which is what the, the uh, attorneys will do in their closing summary, pull all this together. But instead, it meets a, uh, uh, an evidentiary criteria, such as providing an officer with some information upon which he or she acted. Having said all that, let's take about 10 minutes for a recess, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. For the recess, 10 minutes. Can I see cards up here? I have your um, workers' comp papers here.